some physicists have suggested that the universe, the laws of physics, the fundamental constants of physics are fine-tuned in such a way as to bring us into existence. Since the beginning of time, all the matter in the universe has been governed by precisely balanced laws and constants. During an interview with Robin Collins, a philosopher with degrees in mathematics and physics, Strobel learned how these laws offer compelling evidence for a creator and conspire to make the universe habitable for life. The laws of physics are balanced on a razor's edge for life to occur. For example, if you didn't have something like gravity that pulled matter together, you would never get planets, you wouldn't get stars, you wouldn't get any complex organisms. If you didn't have the strong nuclear force, there would be nothing to hold protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. And so you wouldn't have any atoms, so no chemistry. If you didn't have the electromagnetic force, you would have no bonding between chemicals. You'd have no light, and the list goes on. So you need all these sorts of fundamental principles have to be in place in order for life to occur. Wipe out one of those principles, wipe out one of those laws, no life. Strobel learned that life also hinges on the precise strengths and relative values of many different physical constants. One example of this fine tuning is the force of gravity. Imagine a ruler divided up into one inch increments and then stretched across the entire universe, a distance of some 14 billion light years. For the purposes of illustration, the ruler represents the possible range for gravity. In other words, the setting for the strength of gravity could have been anywhere along the ruler, but it just happens to be situated in exactly the right place so that life is possible. Now, if you were to change the force of gravity by moving the setting just one inch compared to the entire width of the universe, the effect on life would be catastrophic. No large-scale life forms could exist. Anything that was more than the size of a pea would be completely crushed. So you might be able to get life of a very, very primitive sort, such as bacteria, but you could never get conscious observers. The strength of gravity is just one of at least 30 separate parameters that must be finely tuned to produce a life-sustaining universe. Another example is the cosmological constant. The cosmological constant describes the expansion speed of space in the universe. If space expands too quickly, then the universe will spread out so quickly that material objects can't form. So you can't get stars and galaxies and planets and the types of things that we, of course, take for granted in our universe. Physicists have determined that the cosmological constant is fine-tuned to one part in a hundred million billion 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 billion. Such precision has been compared to traveling hundreds of miles into space, then throwing a dart at the Earth and hitting a bullseye measuring one trillionth of a trillionth of an inch in diameter, an area less than the width of a single atom. Just consider those two parameters, gravity and the cosmological constant. Their level of fine tuning is to a precision of one part in a hundred million trillion, 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 trillion. I mean, that's like one atom in the entire known universe. This fine tuning is also evident at the atomic level. The strong nuclear force binds atoms together. If the strength of this force were to decrease by one part in 10,000 billion, 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 the only element left in the universe would be hydrogen. Again, chemical life would not be possible. If the universe, if the constants of the universe are indeed fine-tuned, how do we explain it? How do we explain the appearance that the universe is tuned to bring us into existence. Well, theists say God did it. Uh, God tuned, God twiddled the knobs and tuned the physical constants to have exactly the right values. That, of course, is no explanation at all because it leaves unexplained the tuner. 
is just pushing the, the problem back one step. So we can instantly discount explanation number one. Explanation number two is adopted by physicists, I think, Steven Weinberg, who was quoted earlier in this conference. Uh, Steven Weinberg, <coughs> Nobel Prize winning physicist from Texas, um, I think his view is that we don't yet understand enough physics, and when we do, when we have the longed for theory of everything, the TOE, we will then realize that these knobs are not for tuning. There is no freedom, there are no degrees of freedom. Uh, there's only one way for a universe to be. And coming back to the, to the alleged fine-tuning of the universe, um, I was interested in one of the things you saw, well, I mentioned many things, but um, I've always tried to explain it uh, uh, as an amateur, because I'm not a physicist. Um, having accepted the, the word of physicist, that there is a, an element of fine-tuning, and I've tried to lay out three possible explanations. One, one would be God, which, as I've said, isn't an explanation at all. One would be um, the... Um, multiverse and then anthropically with hindsight saying we have to be sitting in one of the universes right. that could give us. But the third one, which I've attributed to you, oh, no. possibly wrongly, oh, no. uh, would be um, I, what I call the macho physicists who say, well, uh, it's just that we don't understand um, uh, why these things that are the other way they are. One day we will, uh, it, when, when we have a theory of everything, it, it will be understood. But it sounds from our conversation as though that I, I misrepresented That in the end, we will not be able to explain uh, the world. That uh, we will have some laws of, some set of laws of nature. We will not be able to derive them on the ground simply of mathematical consistency because we can already think of mathematically consistent laws that don't describe the world as we know it. And we will always be left with a um, question, why are the laws of nature what they are rather than some other laws? And uh, I, I don't see any way out of that. And I, I just regard it as just another one of the tragedies that we have to get used to, uh, like the tragedy that we will die and the tragedy, that, well, I don't want to, uh, linger on tragedy, but uh, I think essentially the position of human beings is a tragic one. Uh, and the more we understand, the more clearly tragic it is. And um, part of it, which particularly affects a physicist, is the tragedy of never being able to come to a really satisfying conclusion of our questions why. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I really am not impressed with the amount of fine-tuning there is, with the exception of this one, one the, the dark energy. Dark, yes. That might, I mean, and that, you can say qualitatively, the amount of dark energy now is comparable to the amount of energy in matter now. It's a few times larger, but it's not very different. Maybe there will be an explanation for that. And, and uh, in a fundamental explanation. Uh, people have aimed at, at that sort of thing. Stephen Hawking, for instance, has. Um, so I think it's fair to say we don't know. But the only explanation that seems to work is that um, this is just one of those things that varies from sub-universe to sub-universe, from Big Bang to Big Bang. In most of the Big Bangs, it's very large. It's much larger than what we observe. And in those big bangs, they go through, because this energy drives the expansion of the universe, depending on whether it's positive or negative, the universe either blows up so rapidly there's no time for galaxies or stars to form, or it crunches, it recollapses so rapidly, again, there's, there's no, no time, time yeah. for life to form. Yes. So it has to be small for life to exist. Uh, and it's about as small as it, as in fact, that's interesting. It's not much smaller than it would have to be to allow life to arise. And the fact that the cancellation is so precise means that the number of universes in the multiverse you need to postulate in order to anthropically mm -hmm. be comfortable with it is very, very large. And it must be at least 10 to the 56, or, yes, or in fact, exactly. uh, yeah. if you think you have some idea about fluctuations at even shorter distances, I think you would say at least 10 to the 120. Uh, in fact, that, 
that's a little disturbing, but it, it, a completely separate development. Not The third explanation is, I think, the one that's probably favored by, oh, no, there are four, actually. Um, Victor Stenger, who will be known to and greatly respected by many people here, um, denies that the, that the universe is fine-tuned at all. And that's a serious point of view that we, that we ought to not forget. And uh, so that the fact that the constants of nature are suitable for life, which is clearly true, we observe. If you discovered a really impressive fine tuning, that uh, if you change some otherwise arbitrary parameter, numerical quantity, by 1% in either direction, life would become impossible. And that was just a free constant in your theory. It could have any value. Uh, then I think you would really uh, be left with only the two other explanations, either a benevolent designer or a multiverse. But assuming that it is fine-tuned, um, the final idea, which I think probably most physicists um, at least have some time for, is the multiverse theory. This is the theory that arises out of the inflationary model of the universe, and it suggests that uh, the, the universe that we know, the only universe of which we have any knowledge or any means of measuring, is a bubble in a foam of billions of bubbles, each one a separate universe. Is that me? Uh, each one a separate universe, and each one having a different set of physical laws and constants. So there's a vast range of universes with different laws and constants. A tiny minority of those universes have their constants tuned in such a way that the universe lasts more than a picosecond, lasts long enough to make galaxies, lasts long enough to make stars, long enough to make chemistry, and to, make, and to let the evolution of life happen. A tiny minority of universes in this bubbling foam have what it takes, and then the anthropic principle kicks in. Of that foaming bubble of all those, all those bubbles in the foam of the multiverse, we have to be living in one of the minority of universes that has what it takes to give rise to us because we are here. Once again, physicists find that a, a bit of a stretch. They find it not exactly implausible, but they think of it as a bit of a cop-out. I actually think it's rather an elegant explanation, um, and uh, it's, I, I, I think it's probably true, but I don't know enough physics to, to know. Um, uh, string theory, you know, is our best hope for a theory unifying all the forces of nature, gravity and all the other forces, all the particles. It's the most um, it's been a little disappointing that it hasn't led to any specific breakthrough in understanding what we already know, but it's still it's the best game in town, the best hope we have for a really fundamental understanding. It was realized a number of years ago, th largely through the work of Edward Witten, uh, that what had seemed to be about half a dozen different possible string theories was really only one string theory, that there's, there's just one string theory, uh, which, but it manifests itself in many in fact, ways. not in half a dozen different ways, but the solutions of string theory are incredibly numerous. And in fact, uh, the estimate that people usually quote, although it's, it's highly uh, approximate, 
is something like 10 to the 500 solutions of string theory. And these solutions fill out what's, what string theorists call a landscape. And uh, each one of them may represent a possible kind of Big Bang. Now, again, this is very speculative uh, because we don't understand string theory at, uh, a real, at the deep level that we need to understand it. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just go on to the final um, science fiction speculation that uh, it, it's kind of rounding off this theme of the theological implications of science fiction. Another science fiction theme um, explored by Daniel Galloy, who is another of my favorite science fiction authors in um, his third book. I can't remember the title, sorry. Um, his, his, his idea, and it's been used by others as well, is that our world may be a gigantic computer simulation in a computer elsewhere in the, in the universe. We are virtual creatures. We're living in a virtual world. Um, as kind of second life, uh, but a much bigger and better, grander second life. Um, I don't know whether you can rule that out. It may be philosophically absurd, but even if, it's, even if it were true, once again we would have the regress. You cannot have complexity, you cannot have the sort of complexity to build a computer, to build a second life software to run us unless the creatures that built that computer evolved. Maybe they're also somebody else's second life, but sooner or later regresses of that kind have to be terminated. You cannot suddenly invent complexity and intelligence. The only way to do it is to start from primeval simplicity and work up gradually. Darwin discovered one way in which you can go from primeval simplicity to prodigies of complexity, and who knows where that might end. There may be other ways. I, obviously, I can't imagine what they would be, or I would have won the Nobel Prize for suggesting them. <laughs> but um, whatever they are, they are going to be like Darwinism, in that they are going to build progressively on primeval simplicity and work up gradually to the sort of complexity that's capable of living, that's capable of thinking, that's capable of building rockets that can go to other star systems, or that's capable of building a computer to simulate life.